Welcome to Lunch of the Lord. I'm Pastor Mark, and we are in Ezra chapter 3. We're going to be starting at verse 3 this lesson, but before we begin, Jeremiah 15, 16, thy words were found, and I did eat them, and thy word was unto me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Now, in chapter 3 and verse 3, actually, in our context of Ezra chapter 3, we have where verses 1 and 2, they go to Jerusalem and they build the altar. And that was the first thing that was set up was the altar. And as we said last lesson, the altar of a person's heart is the first thing that needs to be set up. Not the outward show of a religious person, but the inner heart changed where, where we have a relationship with God and our, our access to God is established in our hearts. Now, verse 3 says, And they set the altar upon his basis, for fear was upon them because of the people of, these, of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. Now, as I said also last lesson, that one of the reasons why they set up the altar first was because of fear of their enemies. They got there and they realized they had this, they, they had this sense that the enemy was against them. The neighboring uh, Gentile nations around them were not happy. So rightly so, they set the altar up uh, in order to, to plead with God. It was, it was the altar which gave them direct connection with God. And they, they set this altar up first to start, start uh, sacrificing unto God and getting his pleasure uh, for, for them. So again, one of the reasons why they set this altar up first was, again, because of opposition around them. Now, in verse 3 here, it says, uh, first part, and they set the altar upon his basis, upon his basis. Now, when it says upon his basis, most of the commentators believe that, that they set, when it says upon his basis, that the altar that they built was in the exact spot where the altar was 70 years ago when Solomon's temple was destroyed, that they found the temple. Uh, as I said last lesson, they or lessons a few lessons ago, they found the place where the temple was in Jerusalem because of the rocks, the size of the rocks and the quality of the rocks that that were that built the temple, the stones that Solomon used. So they found the place where it was. And then they found, must have found where the old altar was also. So they found this place and they begin to build their altar on the same spot where the old altar was. Now, when a backslidden Christian returns to God, they need to go right back to the place where Jesus was crucified, right? on the cross, they need to kneel at the cross and seek repentance and forgiveness. And this is what happens, as I said uh, a while ago, that the book of Ezra is a picture of a backslidden Christian. Uh, when, when the Exodus coming out of Egypt and going through the Red Sea and then going through the Jordan River and entering into the promised land, that's a picture of salvation, a person becoming saved. But when the children of Israel, after they had been in the promised land for many years, they are taken captive by their enemies and taken into Babylon because of disobedience. This is a picture, Ezra and Nehemiah is a picture of a backslidden Christian who at one time, 
knew God and loved God and served God, but they entered into disobedience, a lifestyle of disobedience, and they turned away from God and God gave them to their enemy for some time. And now it's time for them to return and they are coming back to Jerusalem. And this is a picture when they come back to Jerusalem and they build this altar. It's this picture of a backslidden Christian who has strayed from God for however long and they come back to God. The first thing, the first thing that needs to be established is the altar. It's their relationship with God. It's their prayer life. It's their, their time in the word of God, studying and, and, and meditating upon the word of God. That has to be the first thing. It's not the, the church you go to and all the other exterior things. It's that person's relationship being reestablished with God. The altar of burnt offering speaks of the person of Jesus Christ and of his sacrifice. Jesus was the lamb without spot. He died in our place. He took our punishment. And when we go to church or to Bible study, we are to meet together about the person of Christ and, uh, and about his sacrifice for us. The cross is where we should gather. We should be gathering at the cross. Right. And when they set, it says in verse three, and when they set up the altar upon his basis for fear upon them, came upon them because of the countries around them. They they set up the altar upon his basis and then they gathered around this altar. And and the cross, the, the, the altar represents the cross. The cross of Christ is where Christians should gather, whether it's at a Bible study, whether it's at church, whether wherever you, you you gather should be gathering at the cross of Christ. Now, verse four says, they kept also the feast of tabernacles as it is written and offered the daily burnt offerings by number according to the custom as the duty of every day required. Now, as was, as was stated back in verse 1, the Feast of Tabernacles was a time to celebrate two specific events. Number one, the bringing in of the fall harvest and thanking God for that year's crops. And number two, deliverance from, e from Egyptian bondage and their wanderings in the desert. So the Feast of Tabernacles celebrated these two things, the, 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 the God blessing them with crops and also deliverance from Egypt. But this feast here in Ezra would also include a celebration of the return of the Jews from exile. And even these Jews which returned uh, with Zerubbabel would be lax in their observance of keeping God's laws and festivals because we see that about six, listen, six, about 85 years later, after this takes place in Ezra chapter three, verse four, about 85 years later, after Ezra's return to Jerusalem, Ezra comes from Jerusalem with about 2,000 more Jewish people. Ezra reads the law to them and they come to the passage about the Feast of Tabernacles. And it seems as if that this was a new thing to them. They start to observe this feast like it's a new thing. So here, here we have an Ezra chapter 3 and verse 4, they get to Jerusalem, they find where the temple was, and then they find where the old altar was built, and they build this new altar, and they begin to sacrifice. 
and they observed the Feast of Tabernacles. So here in Ezra 4, 3, verse 4, they're observing the Feast of Tabernacles. But if you turn to Nehemiah chapter 8 and verses 14 to 16, in those verses, now it's about 85 years later, Ezra himself has returned, has come from Babylon to Jerusalem with about 2,000 more Jewish people with him. And he reads to them about the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's like, and it's like they didn't know what this feast was. It's like the people in Israel, the people in Jerusalem ha hadn't, hadn't observed the tabernacle. And it was only 85 years before when they, when they got to Jerusalem and they started observing the Feast of Tabernacle for the first time in, in 70 years. And now, and now they, 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 uh, they, they lost, they lost their relationship with God. It just shows you that excitement about the word of God eventually wears down. Emotions can't last forever. There must be a firm and a settled conviction in our hearts to keep the word of God regardless of emotions. I'm sure these Jewish people, when they set this altar up and they began, they began uh, observing uh, uh, the, the burnt offerings and they started in verse 4, uh, keeping the, the Feast of Tabernacles, and they were all excited. We're back. We're home. And let's let's start obeying God and, and observing the things that God has said we should do. And people are excited and they're worked up in their emotions because because the scenery is 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 new to, to a lot of them. And and uh, they're starting to to uh, be live their lives according to the way God had ordained them to live but now but now literally 85 years later with Ezra coming in and and talking to them and reading to them out of the word of God concerning the feast of tabernacles and it was this it was as if they had never read this before you can read it read read Nehemiah chapter 8 verses 14 to 16 just 85 years later and, and and they had lost it. They had lost their relationship with God again. They were in the land. But whether they got bored with the things of God, whether, whether it was pressure, whatever it was, they just had eventually their hearts had strayed away very slowly from the things of God. They weren't observing the Feast of Tabernacles anymore. Who knows if they were observing any of the other feasts or any of the other things of God. This is how wicked our heart can get. And this is just the same way as like a, a Christian can get. Christian can come to the Lord and, you know, they can get all excited and they, you know, their new walk with God and they, you know, they experience their honeymoon with God now and, and the Bible is exciting and this goes on for a year or two or three years and, and then all of a sudden, you know, reality sets in. The mundaneness of life sets in and their hearts begin to look for some kind of new and exciting thing. And, and their hearts stray from God uh, because, because the things of God almost seem like they're boring now. Oh, this again? We got to do the Feast of Tabernacles again? And then what? Then we got the, the Passover feast coming up later, you know. And we got all these other things we got to do. Yeah, we do them year after year, right? We're, we're tired and bored. And this is what, this is how wicked the human heart can get. And, and it's like Christians need, need some kind of stimulation in order to keep them praying. Stimulation in order to keep them reading the word of God. And, and it's a sad thing. In this verse, in verse 4, it says that they did everything according to the custom. Let's read that again. They kept the feast of also the tabernacles, 
as it is written, and they offered the daily burnt offerings by number, what? According to the custom, right? According to the custom, as the duty of every day required. Listen, but God was not interested in their obedience to a prescribed law as if they were robots. God wanted their hearts as he wants our hearts today. Yes, God wants, wants obedience rather than sacrifice, but God wants our heart in the obedience. Our attitude is the key. In the Bible, the word delight speaks of our attitude towards something. If you go to Psalm 1, verse 2, like, like, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the uh, way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, his delight is in the law of the Lord, right? Delight speaks of our attitude. Our delight should be in the law or of the word of God. And in Psalm 37, verse 4, if we delight in the Lord, we will receive the desires of our heart. Right? If we delight in the Lord, God will give us the desires of our heart. And in Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14, these two verses of Scripture speak about the Sabbath day. And the Sabbath day as even we today, as Christians, should be observing a Sabbath day, a, a New Testament Sabbath day. God, in those verses, God promises us special blessings if we would delight to set apart the Sabbath day for him. When we delight in the Lord on the Sabbath day, God will cause us to ride upon the high places of the earth. That means we are seated in heavenly places. And, and he will feed us with the heritage of Jacob thy father. It means we feast upon heavenly truths. And it is a sure thing that God, that because God says that, that the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The reason why, if we delight ourselves in the Lord, God for sure will make these things happen. He says, what? For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth, and I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, thy father. And for Christ uh, us today, you know, God, we, we can... We are seated in heavenly places. We can feast upon the great truths of the Bible, of the word of God. If we delight ourselves in God. But do we delight ourselves in God? Or are we going to get bored? Are we going to get bored after a year or two or three of serving God, right? Are we going to get bored with Bible study? Are we going to get bored with praying? Are we going to get bored with, with these things? with the things of God, we need to check our hearts, check our, our attitudes uh, towards God. Because it speaks of, the, again, this word, when it says we delight ourselves in God, it speaks of our attitude towards him and, and towards the things of God. And then verses five and six, we'll finish this lesson here. And afterward, offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Now, we see in these two verses that the children of Israel began to observe the proper feasts 
and the sacrifices and the free will offerings at their stated times of the year. So they read, they must have been reading the word of God or the word of God must have been read to them to know exactly what feasts to observe and the time of the year. And so they began to do it exactly as God had uh, told Moses. After 70 years of exile, they return with determination to follow God's laws. Happy is the backslider who returns to God's ways from their furnace of affliction, even though their foundation, the foundation of the word of God needs to be reestablished they offer praise and thanksgiving to God. And this is, again, another picture of a backslidden Christian who returns to God. And although, they're, although they are not reestablished in the doctrines of the Bible yet again, yet as long as they establish their relationship to God, praying and, and reading the word of God, that these other things will take place. So again, you know, happy is the backslider who returns to God's ways from the furnace of affliction, from, from taking their own ways and going when they strayed from God, going out into the world. And now God's touched their heart through the Holy Spirit. And they saw that this world is, again, vanity, vanity. And they turn back to God and they want to have their relationship with God restored. And it's just like them here, where they, they come back to God and they, they need to have their hearts reestablished in the things of God. All right, we're going to continue with verse 7 next lesson. But until then, walk with the Lord. I know he walks with you.